Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for having me here and allowing me to ramble for a bit about drystone. Um, this is really going to be very explorative because it's very much a work in progress in connection to my PhD and it's more of a tangent than the main subject matter too. Um, I'm doing my PhD here at the University of Edinburgh and I want to begin by acknowledging that um, this presentation benefits from my research conducted both as my part of my master's and my PhD here uh, and the field work visits and the training were funded by Abercrombie Travel Fund and Graduate Training Funds, uh, respectively. So, with that in mind, moving on to dry stone, I'm sure everyone's quite familiar with the technology, it's kind of ubiquitous um, in the UK. Seems very, very simple in the principle of it, you're just putting stones together, not using any mortar in between, there you go, you have a wall. Um, it's enjoyed a wide popularity around the world, depending on the availability of raw materials, and it has been inscribed on both UNESCO World Heritage List of Intangible Heritage as a technique, and also is represented by some of the UNESCO World Heritage sites and monuments which are utilizing that technique. Um, however, there is actually not that much academic research being done into the dry stone walling as part of Neolithic monuments, which is what I Look at, um, I'm doing my research on the Neolithic cairns and case nests, which obviously utilize that technique quite widely, and they have stood for over 5,000 years, and that's why we can enjoy looking at them and researching them today. And it is largely in part due to the way they were being constructed. So a dry stone wall can stand up for several hundred years, requiring only minor repair, and those repairs are not even always obvious. And I just wanted to quickly run through some of the basic principles of constructions that I was able to learn firsthand through the Drysdale Walling Association's Beginners Course, which is a UK-based uh, organization which is offering courses for both beginners and professionals, and that's how the skill is being taught today to modern practitioners. They have both a scheme to become certified, so they have um, outlined the degrees of expertise you need for a certain level of certification, but the way it's taught is basically still a lot through participation, observation, and a little bit of instruction, but practice is kind of at the heart of learning how to become a dry stone waller, whether it's an amateur or a professional calling. So to build a wall, here's kind of a wall deconstructed. If you're repairing a section, really what you have to do first is take apart the old, old wall and sort out the stones that you're gonna be using. So the sorting of material is a very important step. And then you move on to using the big stones and laying the foundation course, laying courses one by one until you come to about knee height was when you tie the two leaves of the stone together using the spruce stones, which are these massive slabs that you see, and you can either put just the one big one if you have it, or sometimes you use two to kind of connect, and actually that's what holds the structure together ultimately, until you move on further, um, creating um, later courses and you finally tie them all with cope stones. In the meantime, you're paying very strict attention to things like batter, which is the kind of um, framing of the wall is supposed to be A-framed in the end, and also the way that you're fitting the harding stones that you saw in the beginning, those are the rubbly looking things in the center between the two main courses, which you can't actually just dump from a bucket, you're actually supposed to fit them in quite neatly, and also things like pins which are supposed to help you maintain that batter of the wall. So, like I said, on the surface, quite simple. You can technically just throw some stones together and you'll have a wall, but it is a bit of a misleading simplicity. So a lot more needs to happen for a wall to be structurally sound. Um, with that in mind, I wanted to move on to the idea of that technology being used in the Neolithic, which was used quite extensively both here in the UK, um, in Ireland, at um, Atlantic seaboard of France, um, and many other places. So it's really important to look at it from that perspective in my mind. Um, but here in the UK, dry stone, when it comes to Neolithic monuments, is really mentioned mostly as a matter of fact thing. Um, here is a cairn, it was built using dry stone methods, moving on to its symbolic interpretations, phenomenology, um, material culture as proxy ways of looking at it, which are all very modus approaches in themselves, but 
they don't necessarily answer all the questions. Sometimes you have questions of a more technological nature about how many people and how much labor needed to go on into the construction of the monument, but it's still not really touching on the technology itself. Um, the technology is kind of just presumed, intuitive, easy, self-explanatory, um, and to an extent it is. There is some kind of exploration of the origins of Dyson modeling in the Neolithic. One paper, for example, by Jones in 2015, um, kind of put forth that idea that they were drawing inspiration for them in their natural environment on Orkney, which these um, sea cliffs built of the old um, Devonian sandstone and Caithness flagstones kind of look like these neat stacks. And then we're seeing kind of the same picture when we go inside these tombs, um, neat rows, looks very much the same. Obviously, um, quite a plausible and attractive narrative about how they're drawing inspiration from the natural environment and landscape. However, it still doesn't necessarily explain how they arrived at building these structures in the way that is both um, aesthetically what they were looking for and technologically sound for their purposes. Um, so my question then was, is how was this technology developing and propagating? It's great that they've arrived at this style, but there should have been some level of um, knowledge transfer, um, learning and passing down that kind of skill to ensure that we're able to build these tombs and they're being constructed for millennia, even in the Neolithic, um, the time spans quite broad. So to discuss that, I wanted to step back a bit and talk about community and communities of practice, which is the approach I'm going to um, adopt here today for the purposes of the discussion. So all these people are living in communities in the Neolithic, but community is a widely used term in archaeology. However, it kind of remains a little bit under-theorized at times and um, very fluid, which allows a lot of exploration, but at the same time can tend to be a little bit unhelpful. Um, there has been a great edited volume done by Max Sweeney et al. in 2011, and they go into great detail in um, the discussion of community in archaeology and what that means, so I'm not going to ramble on too much about that. I just wanted to point out this kind of diagram of how individuals situated within the community, which is this blue, a diamondy thing, how it fits into the society, kinship and family structures, and how it also interacts with the concept of communities of practice. And an individual can belong simultaneously to many great number of these things, and they don't necessarily always interlap with one another, but there is a great degree of fluidity. And I'm mostly adopting the definition um, by Cummins from a paper from 2016, which is right here on the screen, so I'm not going to go on and repeat that for the sake of time. Um, uh, however, as I've mentioned, as community is this very fluid concept that does uh, uh, depend a lot on shared experiences and shared practices, but doesn't necessarily always correspond with them with living in geographical proximity. Um, I wanted to find something a little bit more specific and a bit more applicable to discussion of dry stone technology in particular, and is a concept that being used to discuss other technologies in the past. So I wanted to touch on this with dry stone today, which is community of practice. Um, and here on the diagram, you can see how it also fits it in the other aspects of living. Um, so for community of practice, I'm adopting the definition put forth by one of the originators of this concept, which is that these are communities formed by people who engage in the process of collectively learning in a shared domain of a human endeavor. And that kind of idea of communities of practice depends on this tripartite um, kind of concept of having a joint enterprise, a shared repertoire, and a mutual engagement, and all these parts fit together to um, allow the learning, the expansion of technology, the development of it, and um, enculturation that goes along with it. So I've kind of adopted this um, diagram from Wenger to um, situate it more related to, uh, in relation to dry stone in particular. Uh, we have building the structures, knowledge and technique and skill that goes into it, as well as any possible apprenticeships, practices, and um, enculturation that goes together with it. And I'll briefly run through um, all of them. So joint enterprise. Um, as far as the chamber cairns go, it's quite 
accepted that since they were often housed in collective and communal burials, it kind of goes hand in hand that their construction would have been a communal and collective endeavor. Um, it is common sense from the point of view of coordinating efforts that are required vis-a-vis -vis labor, collection of raw materials, transportation, sorting the, the raw materials and the construction itself. And it also has implications of how that necessary knowledge and skill would have been transmitted and taught um, as well it would have would have meant for enhancing group ties and cohesion in that process of construction these monuments but also constructing houses we see dry stone houses on Orkney from the Neolithic uh, ritual structures for example Ness of Brogar has a wealth of these kind of structures also built using dry stone we also see it now in historic walls which are also often tied to the ideas of communities or societies because they often delineate boundaries um, between plots of land, for example, in the modern landscape. So it's been a joint enterprise kind of throughout that um, time span. Um, moving on to the shared repertoire, I wanted to briefly touch on the idea of um, what kind of skills and what goes on to the learning and understanding this technology. And this idea of the use of maxims, rules of thumb, and tacit knowledge and stylistic conformity. So these ideas are still um, being explored vis-a-vis -vis the modern practice of dry stone walling and what needs to learn to become a dry stone waller. There was a um, great kind of a PhD study done in 2006 by Farrer who looked at the tacit knowledge in the modern dry stone practitioners, how they learn, how they become experts and what that actually all means. And these kind of principles have been pointed out in the past uh, when the structures have been excavated that a lot of them relied on using that kind of idea of, rule of uh, rules of thumb. But obviously they don't come from nowhere. They should have been taught and enculturated and passed down in this very social um, way. So one needs to learn the main principles of a structurally sound wall and embody that knowledge through extensive practice and um, part of that is the development of original norms or best practices that we're seeing in these monuments. Um, but we also have examples of what I've kind of labeled here as tricks or as known in the literature as um, expedient architecture. And there is some discussion about whether that kind of expedient architecture that we're seeing, is it cutting corners? Is it poor skill level? Um, is it loss of knowledge? But to me, I want to propose a different idea. It, seems like it could also be a sign of very accomplished accomplished craftsmen and I'll um, elaborate on that in a moment but um, here's just some examples of um, you have to know the basic principles but also know how to get around some awkward bits for example in certain orthostat and how you lay the courses around that irregularly shaped stone um, and we see different variations of that obviously and uh, avoiding things like running joints, which lead to structural instability. Um, and this is just an example of what may or may not be labeled as, you know, poor craftsmanship, poor structural integrity, but doesn't necessarily mean that that was actually the case. So thinking about that idea of one needs to learn all these skills from somewhere and we have a span, even with the Karens alone, of millennia that they were being constructed over a large regional span as well. Um, I wanted to briefly touch on the idea of practice that comes up in the modern literature as well. A lot of practice is required before one can become an expert or even competent builder. So there has been a proposition by Barbara from 1992 about the rate of construction of these monuments. And it comes up to about one cairn um, in Caithness and Orkney area, mostly around every 20 years. Obviously, that depends on um, the sample that we have. We might have lost some of the monuments, so that the number is not exactly accurate. But at that rate, it's a very significant event. It occurs to about once a generation. So in the meantime, how is this knowledge being preserved, transmitted, and embodied? Um, and what does it mean for the societal implications? So that's where I wanted to kind of touch on the mutual engagement aspect. So with a very low rate of reproduction compared to most other contemporary practices, such as, for example, lithics or pottery, um, some system of apprenticeship um, might have existed to me. And it's been suggested that um, 
there might have even been specialist engineers or craftsmen or masons. Um, and in the recent paper by Luc Laporte in France, they're kind of touching on that idea that a site might have been overseen by a more specialized person while the rest of the work is having adequate level of skill but are not necessarily engaging um, to the same degree of um, sophistication. So we so far don't really know too much uh, in my understanding about what those apprenticeship systems in Dryston would have looked like, whether this knowledge was widely available or restricted, uh, how formal was the relationship between instructors and trainees. But from um, other studies done in lithics and pottery, we can see that sometimes these kind of apprenticeship take um, form as part of kinship systems. They're being done in family. Sometimes they're being done about outsiders. And even um, occasionally there is a degree of retraining if a person, for example, moves to a different social group through marriage, and then they have to relearn the craft um, in the way of their new kind of community. So that's where the aspect of enculturation and social cohesion uh, comes in because it's not just the technological skill that's been passed down when we're learning something, it's also the norms and moral and aesthetic values that go together um, with that sort of craft. So with that in mind, I kind of briefly wanted to touch on the ideas of tradition and conformity and then on the opposite side of it, innovation and non-conformity. So while we're seeing seemingly standard practices across vast geographies in terms of um, technological ways in which these drystone walls are being contracted, uh, constructed, they're traceable both in the Neolithic and in historic and modern drystone. It is um, not necessarily as simple as it might seem on the surface because, for example, for a modern drystone, it's been suggested that this um, very um, simplified, uh, systematic kind of wall that we're seeing everywhere is a re relatively recent concept from about the 18th century and some of the regional diversity is being lost. So why is this regional diversity being lost? Is it loss of local knowledge? Is it related to best practice and learning what and how to make sure that we are making these enduring structures that are kind of going to stand up and be useful for the purposes we're using them? Or is it tied to the symbolic and cultural significance of the structures we're building? And on the flip side of that is the idea of innovation and nonconformity. Um, is it poor craftsmanship or innovation? For example, in the sites such as Vesterfield, uh, Point of God, Nesebroger, and Palos of Assery, um, there has been some evidence of poor craftsmanship. They're not necessarily technologically sound. Um, there's been some collapse or evidence of um, structural kind of breakage. Um, but on the surface, they would have been very impressive and conform to the ideas of what these cairns should have looked like or what these structures should have looked like. So there's some adaptation for enlargement where they're building orthostatic boxes to um, kind of expedite the process of construction of these very massive cairns. And more examples, of course, are needed to understand this principle fully. But to me, that kind of adaptation is not necessarily a sign of poor craftsmanship because to be able to successfully cut corners and still achieve the result that you're wanting, you need an in-depth understanding of what you're actually doing. Otherwise, your enterprise is going to sometimes quite literally collapse in on itself uh, before you want it to be done. Um, we need to look at regional variation as well, and it's especially evident in the area where I'm focusing on Caithness and Orkney, with Orkney receiving so much more attention and Caithness kind of being a little bit neglected. And a lot of it also depends on um, how much we can get to this idea of innovation nonconformity on whether we're looking at these structures from the point of view of process or outcome. What was more important to them? Was it the final building? At what stage? Because a lot of these are multi-phase sites. Or was it the process of construction, which um, has been suggested played a great role in the construction of these monuments, for example, through the ideas of Leslie McFadden of um, um, quick architecture, which is a very um, integrated process of using material and human bodies in construction of these massive monuments. And I just wanted to point out that, at least to my mind, it's important to keep in mind that both of these outcome and process would have been obviously enculturated. So, just very briefly, identifying communities of practice, specifically in Drestone, more robust excavation is needed 
building archaeology methods have been beneficial, as seen in the example in France by Florian Cousseau and Luc Laporte, um, have done some studies. Um, it allows us a greater understanding of the technological aspect. Um, we need to kind of step back to the local scale, regional context, um, if we want to be getting the identifying conformity, um, paying more attention to micro variations in style, which is common in lithics and pottery, but not so much in these um, larger structures necessarily. And also, uh, to me, that's a very interesting question of identifying these tricks and adaptations for the expediency of architecture and how you can successfully cut corners, so to speak. Um, and um, as far as pottery and lithics go, for example, there's been a lot of ethnographic and ethnoarchaeological parallels drawn, so I think that could be very beneficial for the study of dry stone as well. Um, why is it relevant? These are just some examples of better understanding of the practice of the past leads to better understanding how we can manage these monuments in the future. For example, this is an example of um, one of the Camster cairns that was reconstructed in the 80s and that reconstruction is kind of being questioned a lot in the um, applicability to this particular site. Um, it's still dry stone, but it looks a little bit odd in the context of the site itself. Um, we're seeing these um, modern approaches and Neolithic approaches interact almost quite literally this Ormigil North in Caithness as well, where on the right you have Neolithic dry stone modeling, and on the left here this is a, a World War II machine gun post built from the same stones and kind of fit into the same structure, so that could help us understand that a bit better and how we can tell these things apart as well in terms of reuse. So in lieu of conclusion, um, just to wrap up, implications of knowledge transmissions mechanism obviously go beyond just understanding of technology. It helps us understand identity and culture. More studies on the how of prehistoric dry stone are needed and not just on the tensile strength of the stones or similar structural implications alone, which is quite popular nowadays. And uh, more robust methodologies needed for further research into the prehistoric communities of, dry, dry, of practice in specifically um, regards to dry stone. And that could also help us answer the question of where have all the dry stone gone from where did the sites go if there are more of them and kind of where did the practice kind of die down and disappear because it's now just part of the vernacular more so than formal architecture. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you for having me and allowing me to ramble on. <laughs>